Hormone replacement treatments or therapy, otherwise known as HRT, have been used in patients for a long time, but due to the fact that these hormones are often sourced from animals which have a different molecular structure to humans, they're not effectively absorbed and metabolized into our systems, and they can therefore increase the potential of breast and ovarian cancer. I'm now joined by Dr. Graham Duncombe to shed some light on the healthier alternatives available. It is a question that we've been receiving since season one. Um, and I actually made a joke with you off air now saying that we talk about hormones more now, but it's not just a female thing. Men not are struggling all. too as exactly, well. Exactly, Stacey. I think that's very underdiagnosed yes. in many patients at the yeah. moment. So. so what are you seeing in your practices? Are people more aware of the fact that they have hormonal imbalances? Are there um, stark symptoms that you're seeing as well? Absolutely correct. So I think most of our patients present with uh, symptoms of weight gain, uh, fatigue, hot flushes, flushes. night sweats, um, uh, inability to sleep correctly, so insomnia is often a, a presenting concern. And those patients might not always have uh, the information that their hormones are going into deterioration, mm. so we confirm that for them. And um, we can actually work out which hormones they're actually lacking. Yeah. And of course it changes throughout our lives because your hormone levels are at their maximum, let's say at their full potential probably between the ages of 20 and 30. Yeah. And obviously in women, there's a cyclic change in your hormone pattern during the month, but, but on average, they're pretty much at their best levels in that decade. So and sorry to interrupt you, no, 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 but from yeah. the age of 30 already in, in women, progesterone can go into decline. And in men, testosterone can go into decline already from the age of 30. So the thing about the body is that nothing ever works in isolation, right? So how would you know when you need to address hormonal imbalances versus other concerns? You would always start with having a look at your metabolism first. Because okay. if your metabolism isn't corrected, obviously any hormone balancing that you attempt is going to throw out your metabolism even further. So we usually follow a protocol of looking at energy pathways in our patients, then having a look at the adrenal glands, balancing that adrenal production, because a lot of the adrenal hormones are the building blocks, the foundation yes. blocks of the other hormones, um, correcting metabolism with thyroid hormone control, and then having a look at the cyclic hormones, which are very important, I'd say, for okay. the anti-aging aspect. Okay, so it's sort of like a pyramid and exactly. it builds up. Okay. Exactly. Well, we, I mentioned HRT, and it's one of the questions that we get asked the most, and obviously specifically from menopausal women. Um, there's a lot of controversy here. Clear it up for us. Absolutely. <laughs> if we look at when hormone replacement therapy became a viable treatment for women, we're going back as far as about 1935, yeah. when they realized that if they gave a hormone replacement to women who are experiencing symptoms, these women would have relief. But those hormones were animal sourced, and we actually still use some of those hormones today, but they are very potent. Mm. They obviously have the same kind of chemical binding structure to tissue in the body, so they can bind to the receptors in the cells that they require, mm. but they give a very powerful message to those cells. Mm. So with longer use, obviously you have longer impact on that cell, which mm. raises the chance of cancer. Mm. Um, they realize that you have to start combining different hormones to get better uh, beneficial effects. But um, it wasn't until about 1995, I'd say, that they realized that they'd need to take a gentler approach because there was such a high risk and incidence of complications with this hormone replacement therapy. Okay. And the big scare came with a massive study that was undertaken called the Women's Health Initiative yes. study in 2002, yeah. where they actually proved that to take two, synth we call them synthetic or mm. biosimilar hormones, together raised your risk of cancer instead of uh, being beneficially protective. Yeah. And it was so dramatic they had to take women off the study prematurely because the cancer rates were climbing so yeah. rapidly. Yeah. So it gave a lot of women and doctors and practitioners a scare and doctors realized that prescribing hormones had short-term benefits but it had a great long-term risk that it carried. Yeah. And they were stuck with this problem of trying to protect women against the effects of aging and declining hormones and how to protect them against the um, cancer risk or the, yeah. the cancerous changes that could take place. So a lot of confusion comes in with the words natural, synthetic, animal derived. Can you clear some of that up for us as well? Absolutely, so I think that's what causes a lot of confusion mm. in many patients' minds. Because if you think about those original hormones used in hormone replacement therapy, they were really natural hormones mm. because they were animal derived, mm. but their potency or their mode of action um, was way too strong if you compare it to, to the potency of a human hormone. So if you think of the glands in the body as message centers that produce 
uh, messages, which we call hormones, which are carried to different tissues and they're delivered to those tissues to give an instruction where that tissue must now do some repair work or produce proteins or reduce inflammation, etc. Mm. If you're supplying the message that is so much more potent, that cell becomes overstimulated with time. Mm. And we're sure that that is one of the main reasons why women had this increased risk of breast cancer and uterine cancer after using these hormones. When you combine it with a further synthetic derivative of a progestin, um, the cells would get even more of a potent message, mm. mixed message. And the complication is further um, involved in the metabolism of those products. Mm. So your body can recognize its own hormones, knows how to metabolize the different components of the hormones, but as soon as you have this alien, if we can call it an alien abnormal hormone that's mm. introduced, the metabolism will produce different molecules and those have to be dealt with by the body. So and then, okay, yeah. So it can cause, of course, more complications for that patient. So natural hormones aren't always the safest. Okay. Synthetic hormones also aren't always the safest. safest. And that's where the bioidentical yeah. hormone combination comes in, is we take the source, the backbone of that hormone, which is almost based on a cholesterol molecule backbone, from a plant source such as soy or, or yam mm -hmm. and we rebuild it in the in the laboratory to form an exact carbon copy of a human hormone and okay. that's why it's bioidentical. Okay. So your body can recognize that the message delivered is of the same potency and it's metabolized the same way as a, as a natural Are hormone these um, tablets, are they creams, are they patches, how do, you know, what are the different forms of bioidentical They were hormones? very restricted in the beginning, so yeah. see, but now we've got a huge variety. Yeah. It all depends on how the absorbability is. So if you're applying something to your skin, you obviously have to be sure that that product is dissolved mm. into the, um, the cream and that it can be absorbed correctly through the skin. So there are very effective transdermal or skin applied mm -hmm. uh, creams. There are some tablets, although hormones taken as tablets generally put a lot of strain on the liver. So we try and steer clear of tablets where possible, okay. although progesterone is one of the more gentler capsules that one could take orally. Um, testosterone, on the other hand, is very dangerous. We try and stay completely clear of oral tablets for testosterone. And then, of course, one of the more convenient uh, modes of delivery is a pellet implantation, where we take a slowly dissolving hormone in a, a kind of a soy base, mm -hmm. place that under the skin where it will deliver the same amount of hormone on a daily basis, which can last anywhere between four and six months. Okay, so this is where um, your the Renewal Institute would come in because you've still got to guide patients here. There's a lot of confusion that they need to clear up, but even when it comes to your bioidentical or natural, there's still a way to process Correct. it, right? Or to, to guide the patient through Absolutely that. Tell us how yeah. you work uniquely in this space. Very important because even though these are very um, safe molecules to work with, yeah. they're still medications, yeah. they still have a potent effect. So you've got to guide your patient in the correct dosage, first of all. What their body needs is going to determine what you're going to prescribe for them. The correct mode of delivery, so again, mm. some patients absorb well through the skin, some absorb well through the gut, some might need a pellet implantation. What their risk factors are, if they've mm -hmm. got a family history of breast cancer, for instance, we've got to change the ratios of how we supply these hormones and how their body deals with those hormones because genetically we don't all follow the same pathway to break those hormones down. down and yeah. some of us can actually accumulate hormones with time. And if you're not aware of that in your patient, even though you're using a relatively safe procedure and treatment, you could be putting them at risk. Are you giving advice, just as we, we wrap it up, around diet as well? Because Correct. I don't think a lot of menopausal women know that diet can help them immensely Absolutely. in reducing those symptoms. Absolutely. Our diet can be one of the main sources of what we call xenoestrogens yes. or environmental estrogens. Yep. And if you're a, an accumulator of those hormones, you're going to have a large impact from diet on your health and your well-being for the future. So we try to help those patients with a healthy diet that's perhaps low in factory farm dairy, um, try to help them with liver cleansing, yeah. with colon health. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to do with digestion and with uh, absorption and um, removal of toxins yeah. from the system that's important. And I'm sure with the men as well, sorry guys, I am thinking about you, with the men you'll also be looking at something that's become um, quite prevalent, which is estrogen dominance correct, as well. Correct, correct. We're seeing a lot of that because of our exposure to plastics and yes. pesticides and, and hormones and food. And um, we're seeing a lot of men get 
an imbalance between their testosterone levels mm. and their estrogen levels. Mm. So we're seeing that at younger and younger ages and it's influencing fertility and it's influencing development. So those are very important issues that we can pick up from a young age. Yeah. I'd speak to you all day, but unfortunately <laughs> we've run out of time. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much for great. coming into Thank studio you. and Thanks chatting to us. Yeah, and clearing fantastic. things up for us.